Moby Dick, or, The Whale. By Herman Melville, author. 1851. Contents. Chap. I. Loomings. 1. XL. Foxel. Mid. 2. The Carpet Bag. 7. Night. 189. 3. The Spouter Inn. 11. XLI. Moby Dick. 196. 4. The Counterpane. 28. XLII. The Whiteness of. T. Breakfast. 32. The Whale. 207. 6. The Street. 35. Slyene. Hark. 217. 7. The Chapel. 37. XLIV. The Chart. 218. 8. The Pulpit. 41. XLV. The Affidavit. 224. 9. The Sermon. 44. XL6. Surmises. 231. X. A Bosom Friend. 54. Slay I. The Mat Maker. 237. 11. Nightgown. 58. Slay Eighth. The First Lowering. 240. 12. Biographical. 61. XLIX. The Hyena. 252. 13. Wheelbarrow. 63. L. Ahab's Boat and. 14. Nantucket. 69. Crufadala. 255. 15. Chowder. 71. Lee. The Spirit Spout. 258. 16. The Ship. 75. Lee. The Pequod Meets. 17. The Ramadan. 91. The Albatross. 262. 18. His Mark. 97. Liii. The Gam. 264. 19. The Prophet. 102. Live. The Town Hose. XX. All Astir. 106. Story. 269. XXI. Going Aboard. 108. LV. Monstrous Pictures. XXII. Merry Christmas. 112. Of Wales. 292. XXIII. The Lee Shore. 117. LVI. Less Erroneous Pick. XXIV. The Advocate. 118. Tours of Wales. 298. XXV. Postscript. 124. LVII. Of Wales in Paint. XXVI. Knights and Squires. 125. In Teeth, NC. 302. XXVII. Knights and Squires. 128. Laiene. Brit. 305. XXVIII. Ahab. 133. Licks. 308. XXIX. Enter Ahab, to him. LX. The line. 311. Stub. 137. LXI. Stub kills a whale. 315. Triple X. The pipe. 141. LXII. 
the dart. 321. XXXI. Queen Mab. 142. Lziath. The crotch. 322. XXXII. Cytology. 144. LXIV. Stub Supper. 324. XXXIII. The Spexander. 159. LXV. The Whale as a. Thursive. The Cabin Table. 162. Dish. 333. XXXV. The Masthead. 169. LXVI. The Shark Moss. 30. The Quarter Deck. Saker. 336. Ahab and All. 176. Luxi. Cutting in. 33s. XXXVII. 185. Luxi. The Blanket. 340. 38. Dusk. 186. LXIX. The Funeral. 343. Thir 6. First Night Watch. 188. LXX. The SPHYNX. 345. 6. Contents. Chap. Page. Chap. Page. LXXI. The Pequod Meets. CII. A Bobber in the AR. The Jeroboam. Sassides. 498. Her Story. 348. CM. Measurement of the. LCI. The Monkey Rope. 355. Whale Skeleton. 503. LCI. Stub and Flask Kill. Siv. The Fossil Whale. 506. A Right Whale. 360. CV. Does the Whale Did. Lsiv. The Sperm Whales. Minish 1. 510. Head. 366. CVI. Ahab's Leg. 515. LXXV. The Right Whales. CVII. The Carpenter. 518. Head. 371. Kain. The Deck. Ahab. Lskxi. The Batter Ingram. 374. And the Carpenter. 521. Lskxi. The Great Heidel. CIX. The Cabin. Ahab. Bergton. 377. And Starbuck. 526. Lskxi. Cistern and Buck. X. Queek in his. ETS. 379. Coffin. 529. L6. The Prayer. 384. CXI. The Pacific. 535. LXXX. The Nut. 387. CXII. The Blacksmith. 537. Lskxi. The Pequod Meats. Xiath. The Forge. 540. The Virgin. 390. CXIV. The Gilder. 544. Lskxi. The Honor End. CXV. The Pequod Meats. Glory of Wool. The Bachelor. 546. Ying. 402. CXVI. The Dying Whale. 549. 
Lskseith. Jonah historically. Ketai. The Whale Watch. 550. Regarded. 406. Katine. The Quadrant. 552. Lskseith. Pitch Polling. 408. CXIX. The Candles. 555. LXXXV. The Fountain. 411. CXX. The Deck. 562. Lskxi. The Tail. 417. CXXI. Midnight, on the. Lskxi. The Grand Arma. Foxal. 563. De. 422. Xi. Midnight, aloft. 565. Lskxi. Schools and School. Xi. The Musket. 565. Masters. 436. Siv. The Needle. 569. Lsk 6. Fast Fish and. X. The Log and Line. 573. Loose Fish. 440. C. The Life Buoy. 577. XC. Heads or Tails. 444. CI. Ahab and the Car. XCI. The Pequod Meat 3. Penter. 581. The Rosebud. 447. CI. The Pequod Meats. XCII. Ambergris. 455. The Rachel. 583. Scheme. The Castaway. 458. 6. The Cabin. Ahab. XCIV. A Squeeze of the. And Pip. 587. Hand. 463. X. The Hat. 589. XCV. The Cassock. 467. Thirsty. The Pequod Meats. XCVI. The Triworks. 468. The Delight. 594. Skadii. The Lamp. 474. Thirsty. The Symphony. 590. Skadiath. Stowing Down and. Thirsteeth. The Chase. First. Clearing Up. 474. Day. 601. XCIX. The Doubloon. 478. Thirsiv. The Chase. Second. C. The Pequod Meats. Day. 611. The Samuel N. X. The Chase. Third. Derby of London. 485. Day. 621. CI. The Decanter. 493. Epilogue. IOBY Dick. Or. The Whale. Etymology. Supplies by a late consumptive usher to a grammar school. The pale usher threadbare in coat, heart, body, and brain, I see him. Now. He was ever dusting his old lexicons and grammars, with a queer handkerchief, mockingly embellished with all the gay flags of all the known nations of the world. He loved to dust his old grammars. It somehow mildly reminded him of his mortality. Etymology. While you take in hand to school others, and to teach them by what name a whalefish is to be called in our tongue. Leaving out, through ignorance, the letter H, which almost 
alone make up the signification of the word, you deliver that. Which is not true. Hackle you it. Whale. Asterisk 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 sw. And Dan. Vol. This animal. Is named from roundness or rolling, for in Dan. Vault is arched. Or vaulted. Webster's Dictionary. Whale. Asterisk 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 it is more immediately from the D-U-T and G-E-R Wallen, A-S Wallowian, to roll, to wallow Richardson's Dictionary V. Hebrew X-R, Raj Greek Cetus Latin Holsel Anglo-Saxon Vault Danish Wall. Dutch. H-W-A-L. Swedish. Whale. Icelandic. Whale. English. Baline. French. Balina. Spanish. P-K-N-U-E-E-N-U-E. Fiji. P-E-N-U-E-E-N-U-E. A Romangoan. Extracts. Pound double trite J J A A pound U and asterisk pound U six equals one lt at fat. It will be seen that this mere painstaking burrower and grub worm of a poor devil of a sub sub appears to have gone through the long Vatican's and street stalls of the earth, picking up whatever random allusions to whales he could anyways find in any book whatsoever, sacred or profane. Therefore you must not, in every case at least, take the Higgledy piggledy whale statements, however authentic, in these extracts. For veritable gospel cytology. Far from it. As touching the ancient authors generally, as well as the poets here appearing, these extracts are solely valuable or entertaining, as affording a glancing bird's eye view of what has been promiscuously said, thought, fancied, and sung. Of Leviathan, by many nations and generations, including our own. So fare thee well, poor devil of a sub-sub, whose commentator I am. Thou belongest to that hopeless, sallow tribe which no wine of this world will ever warm, and for whom even pale sherry would be too rosy strong, but with whom one sometimes loves to sit, and feel poor devilish, too, and grow convivial upon tears, and say to them, bluntly, with full eyes and empty glasses, and in not altogether, unpleasant sadness give it up, sub-subs. For by how much the more, pains ye take to please the world, by so much the more shall ye for, ever go thankless. Would that I could clear out Hampton Court and, the Tilleries for ye, but gulp down your tears and high aloft to the, royal mast with your hearts, for your friends who have gone before, are clearing out the seven-storied heavens, and making refugees of long-pampered Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael, against your coming. Here ye strike but splintered hearts together there, ye shall strike. Unsplinterable glasses. A asterisk. XDA it's. And God created great whales. Genesis. Leviathan make the path to Shin 5 after him. One would think the deep tea be hoary. Job. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up. Jonah. Jonah. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Psalms. In that day, the Lord with his sore, and great, and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even. Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon. That is in the sea. Isaiah. And what thing soever besides cometh within the chaos of this monster's mouth, be it beast, boat, or stone, down it goes. All incontinently that foul great swallow of his, and perisheth in the bottomless gulf of his paunch. Holland's Plutarch's Morals. The Indian sea breedeth the most and the biggest fishes that are, among which the whales and whirlpools called Balsen, 
take up as much in length as four acres or our pens of land. Holland's Pliny. Extracts. Scarcely had we proceeded two days on the sea, when about sunrise a great many whales and other monsters of the sea appeared. Among the former, one was of a most monstrous size. Asterisk asterisk this came towards us, open-mouthed, raising the waves on all sides, and beating the sea before him into a foam. Took solution. The true history. He visited this country also with a view of catching horse. Whales, which had bones of very great value for their teeth, of which he brought some to the king. Asterisk 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 the best. Whales were catched in his own country, of which some were 48, some 50 yards long. He said that he was one of six who had killed 60 in two days. Other or zero ethers verbal narrative taken down from his mouth by King Alfred. A. D. 890. And whereas all the other things, whether beast or vessel, that enter into the dreadful gulf of this monster's, whale's, mouth, are immediately lost and swallowed up, the sea gudgeon retires into it in great security, and there sleeps. Montaigne. Apology for Raymond VII. Let us fly, let us fly. Old Nick take me if it is not. Leviathan described by the noble prophet Moses in the life of Patient Job. Rabelais. This whale's liver was two cartloads. Stowe's annals. The great leviathan that make the seas to seethe like. Boiling pen. Lord Bacon's version of the Psalms. Touching that monstrous bulk of the whale or orc we have. Received nothing certain. They grow exceeding fat, insomuch. That an incredible quantity of oil will be extracted out of one. Whale. Ibid history of life and death. Extracts. The sovereignest thing on earth is parmaceti for an inward. Bruise. King Henry. Very like a whale. Hamlet. Which to secure, no skill of leech's art. Mote him avail, but to return again. To his wounds worker, that with lowly dart. Dinting his breast, had bred his restless pain. Like as the wounded whale to shore flies through the. Main. The fairy queen. Immense as whales, the motion of whose vast bodies can. In a peaceful calm trouble the ocean till it boil. Sir William Davenant. Preface to Gondi Bird. What spermaceti is, men might justly doubt, since the. Learned Hosmanius in his work of thirty years, saith plainly. Nescio quids it. Sir T. Brown. Of spermaceti and the. Sperma CD whale. Vidi his V. E. Like Spencer's talus with his modern flail. He threatens ruin with his ponderous tail. Their fixed joblins in his side he wears. And on his back a grove of pikes appears. Waller's Battle of the Summer Islands. By art is created that great leviathan, called a common. Wealth or state, in Latin, civitas, which is but an artificial. Man. Opening sentence of Hobo's 1s Leviathan. Silly man soul swallowed it without chewing, as if it had. Been a sprat in the mouth of a whale. Pilgrim's Progress. Extracts. That sea beast. Leviathan, which god of all his works. Created hugest that swim the ocean stream. Paradise lost. Their Leviathan. Hugest of living creatures in the deep. Stretched like a promontory sleeps or swims. And seems a moving land, and at his gills. Draws in, and at his breath spouts out a sea. Ibid. The mighty whales which swim in a sea of water, and. Have a sea of oil swimming in them. Fuller's profane and holy state. So close behind some promontory lie. The huge leviathans to attend their prey. And give no chase, but swallow in the fry. Which through their gaping jaws mistake the way. Drydries Anus Mirabilis. 
while the whale is floating at the stern of the ship, they cut off his head, and tow it with a boat as near the shore as it will come, but it will be aground in 12 or 13 feet. Water. Thomas Edges 10 Voyages to Spitsbergen, in Perchas. In their way they saw many whales sporting in the ocean. And in wantonness fuzzing up the water through their pipes and vents, which nature has placed on their shoulders. Sir T. Herbert S. Voyages into Asia and Africa. Harris Call. Here they saw such huge troops of whales, that they were forced to proceed with a great deal of caution for fear they should run their ship upon them. Scouting Sixth Circumnavigation. Extracts. We set sail from the Elba, Wind N. E. In fly ship called. The Jonas in the Whale. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Some say the whale can't open his mouth, but that is a fable. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. They frequently climb up the masts to see whether they can see a whale, for the first discoverer has a ducat for his pains. I was told of a whale taken near Shetland, that had above a barrel of herrings in his belly. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. One of our harpooners told me that he caught once a whale in Spitsbergen that was white all over. A voyage to Greenland, A.D. 1671. Harris Call. Several whales have come in upon this coast, 5. Anno 1652, 180 feet in length of the whale bone kind. Came in, which, as I was informed, besides a vast quantity of oil, did afford 500 weight of baleen. The jaws of it stand for a gate in the garden of Pitfarren. Sabalk vs 5 and can Ross. Myself have agreed to try whether I can master and kill this spermaceti whale, for I could never hear of any of that sort that was killed by any man, such as his fierceness and swiftness. Richard Strafford's letter from the Bermudas. Phil. Trans. A. D. 1668. Whales in the Sea. God's Voice Obey. N. E. Primer. We saw also abundance of large whales, there being more. In those southern seas, as I may say, by a hundred to one. Then we have to the northward of us. Captain Cowley's voyage round the globe. A. B. 1729. A asterisk U asterisk asterisk U and J T. He breath of the whale is frequently attended with such an insupportable smell as to bring on a disorder of the brain. U U O A South America. Extracts. 250 chosen S Y L P H S of special note. We trust the important charge, the petticoat. Oft have we known that sevenfold fence to fail. Though stuffed with hoops and armed with ribs of whale. Rape of the lock. If we compare land animals in respect to magnitude, with those that take up their abode in the deep, we shall find they will appear contemptible in the comparison. The whale is doubtless the largest animal in creation. Goldsmith, Nat. His. If you should write a fable for little fishes, you would make them speak like great whales. Goldsmith to Johnson. In the afternoon we saw what was supposed to be a rock. But it was found to be a dead whale, which some Asiatics had killed, and were then towing ashore. They seemed to endeavor to conceal themselves behind the whale, in order to avoid being seen by us. Cook's Voyages. The larger whales, they seldom venture to attack. They stand in so great dread of some of them, that when out at sea, they are afraid to mention even their names, and carry dung, limestone, juniper wood, and some other articles of the same nature in their boats, in order to terrify and prevent their too near approach. T.J.N. Ovan Troy vs. Letters on Banks S. and 
Solander's voyage to Iceland in 1772. The spermaceti whale found by the Nantuckhoys, is an active, fierce animal, and requires vast address and boldness in the fishermen. Thomas Jefferson's whale memorial to the French minister in 1778. And pray, sir, what in the world is equal to it v. Edmund Burke's reference in Parliament to the Nantucket whale fishery. Extracts Spain a great whale stranded on the shores of Europe. Edmund Burke, somewhere. A tenth branch of the king's ordinary revenue, said to be grounded on the consideration of his guarding and protecting the seas from pirates and robbers, is the right to royal fish, which are whale and sturgeon. And these, when either thrown ashore or caught near the coast, are the property of the king. Blackstone. Soon to the sport of death the crews repair. Rodmond unerring o'er his head suspends. The barbed steel, an E.V. turn attends. Falconer's shipwreck. Bright shone the roofs, the domes, the spires. And rockets blew self-driven. To hang their momentary fire. Around the vault of heaven. So fire with water to compare. The ocean serves on high. Upspouted by a whale in air. To express unwieldy joy. Cooper, on the Queen's visit to London. Ten or fifteen gallons of blood are thrown out of the heart. At a stroke, with immense velocity. John Hunter's account of the dissection. Of a whale. A small-sized one. The aorta of a whale is larger in the bore than the main. Pipe of the water works at London Bridge, and the water roar. Ing in its passage through that pipe is inferior in impetus and Velocity to the blood gushing from the whale's heart. Paley's Theology. The whale is a mammiferous animal without hind feet. Baron Cuvier. Extracts. In 40 degrees south, we saw spermaceti whales, but did not take any till the 1st of May, the sea being then covered with them. Colnett's voyage for the purpose of extending the spermaceti whale finery. In the free element beneath me swam. Floundered and dived, in play, in chase, in battle. Fishes of every color, form, and kind. Which language cannot paint, and mariner. Had never seen, from dread leviathan. To insect millions peopling every wave. Gathered in shoals immense, like floating islands. Led by mysterious instincts through that waste. And trackless region though on every side. Assaulted by voracious enemies. Whales, sharks, and monsters, armed in front or jaw. With swords, saws, spiral horns, or hooked fangs. Montgomery's world before the flood. Io. Pian. Io. Sing. To the finny people's king. Not a mightier whale than this. In the vast Atlantic is. Not a fatter fish than he. Flounders round the polar sea. Charles Lamb's triumph of the whale. In the year 1690 some persons were on a high hill observe. Ing the whales spouting and sporting with each other, when. One observed, there pointing to the sea is a green pasture. Where our children's grandchildren will go for bread. Obed Macy's History of Nantucket. I built a cottage for Susan and myself and made a gateway. In the form of a gothic arch, by setting up a whale's jaw. Bones. Hawthorne's she is told tales. She came to bespeak a monument for her first love, who. Had been killed by a whale in the Pacific Ocean, no less than. Forty years ago. Ibid. Extracts. No, sir, tis a right whale, answered Tom. I saw his spout, he threw up a pair of as pretty rainbows as a Christian would wish to look at. He's a raw oil but, that fellow. Cooper's pilot. The papers were brought in, and we saw in the Berlin Gazette that whales had been introduced on the stage there. Eckerman Ruff's conversations with Goethe. My God. M.R. Chase, 
what is the matter? I answered, we have been stove by a whale. Narrative of the shipwreck of the whale ship. Essex of Nantucket, which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large sperm whale. In the Pacific Ocean. By Owen Chase of Nantucket, first mate of said vessel. New York. 1821. A mariner sat in the shrouds one night. The wind was piping free. Now bright, now dimmed, was the moonlight pale. And the phosphor gleamed in the wake of the whale. As it floundered in the sea. Elizabeth Oakes Smith. The quantity of line withdrawn from the different boats. Engaged in the capture of this one whale, amounted altogether. To 10,440 yards or nearly 6 English miles. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Sometimes the whale shakes its tremendous tail in the air, which, cracking like a whip, resounds to the distance of three or four miles. Scoresby. Mad with the agonies he endures from these fresh attacks. The infuriated sperm whale rolls over and over, he rears his enormous head, and with wide expanded jaw snaps at a verve. Thing around him, he rushes at the boats with his head, they are propelled before him with vast swiftness, and sometimes utterly destroyed. Asterisk 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 it is a matter of great astonishment that the con consideration of the habits of so interesting, and, in a commercial extracts point of view, of so important an animal, as the sperm whale, should have been so entirely neglected, or should have excited so little curiosity among the numerous, and many of them calm, potent observers, that of late years must have possessed the most abundant and the most convenient opportunities of witnessing their habit youths. Thomas Beadle's History of the Sperm Whale, 1839. The cachalot, sperm whale, is not only better armed than the true whale, Greenland or right whale, in P.O.S. Sessing a formidable weapon at either extremity of its body, but also more frequently displays a disposition to employ these weapons offensively, and in a manner at once so artful, bold, and mischievous, as to lead to its being regarded as the most dangerous to attack of all the known species of the whale tribe. Frederick D. Bell Bennett's Whaling Voyage Round the Globe 1840 October 13. There she blows, was sung out from the masthead. Where away? demanded the captain. Three points off the lee bow, sir. Raise up your wheel. Steady. Steady, sir. Masthead ahoy. Do you see that whale now? Aye aye, sir. A shoal of sperm whales. There she blows. There she breaches. Sing out. Sing out every time. Aye aye, sir. There she blows. There there thar she. Blows bows bo o o s. How far off? Two miles and a half. Thunder and lightning. So near. Call all hands. J. Ross Brown's etchings. Of a whaling cruise. 1846. The whale ship globe, on board of which vessel occurred. The horrid transactions we are about to relate, belong to the island of Nantucket. Narrative of the Globe Mutiny, by Lay and Hussey Survivors. A. D. 1828. Extracts. Being once pursued by a whale which he had wounded, he parried the assault for some time with a lance but the furious monster at length rushed on the boat, himself and comrades, only being preserved by leaping into the water when they saw the onset was inevitable. Missionary Journal of Tireman and Bennett. Nantucket itself, said M.R. Webster, is a very striking and peculiar portion of the national interest. There is a population of eight or nine thousand persons, living here in the sea, 
adding. Largely every year to the national wealth by the boldest and most persevering industry. Report of Daniel Webster's speech in the U.S. Senate, on the application for the erection of a breakwater at Nantucket. 1828. The whale fell directly over him, and probably killed him. In a moment. The whale and his captors, or the whalemen's. Adventures and the whale's biography, gathered. On the homeward cruise of the Commodore. Preble. By Rev. Henry T. Cheever. If you make the least damn bit of noise, replied Samuel. I will send you to hell. Life of Samuel Comstock, the mutineer, by his brother, William Comstock. Another ver. Zion of Teak Whale Ship Globe Narrative. The Voyages of the Dutch and English to the Northern Ocean, in order, if possible, to discover a passage through it to India, though they failed of their main object, laid open the haunts of the whale. McCulloch's Commercial Dictionary. These things are reciprocal, the ball rebounds, only to bound forward again, for now in laying open the haunts of the whale, the whalemen seem to have indirectly hit upon new close to that same mystic northwest passage. From something unpublished. Extracts. It is impossible to meet a whale ship on the ocean without being struck by her near appearance. The vessel under short sail, with lookouts at the mastheads, eagerly scanning the wide expanse around them, has a totally different air from those engaged in a regular voyage. Currents and whaling. J.J. S. X. X. Pedestrians in the vicinity of London and elsewhere may recollect having seen large curved bones set upright in the earth either to form arches over gateways, or entrances to alcoves. And they may perhaps have been told that these were the ribs of whales. Tales of a whale voyager. To the Arctic Ocean. It was not till the boats returned from the pursuit of these whales, that the whites saw their ship in bloody possession of the savages enrolled among the crew. Newspaper account of the taking and retaking of the whale ship Hobo Mac. It is generally well known that out of the crews of whaling vessels, American, few ever return in the ships on board of which they departed. Cruise in a whale boat. Suddenly a mighty mass emerged from the water, and shot up perpendicularly into the air. It was the whale. Miriam Coffin or the whale fisherman. The whale is harpooned to be sure, but bethink you, how? You would manage a powerful unbroken cold, with the mere appliance of a rope tied to the root of his tail. A chapter on whaling in ribs and trucks. On one occasion I saw two of these monsters, whales, pro. Babbly male and female, slowly swimming, one after the other. Within less than a stone's throw of the shore, terra del fu. Ego, over which the beech tree extended its branches. Danvin's voyage of a naturalist. Stern all. Exclaimed the mate, as upon turning his head. He saw the distended jaws of a large sperm whale close to the. Extracts. Head of the boat, threatening it with instant destruction. Stern all, for your lives. Wharton the whale killed her. So be cheery, my lads, let your hearts never fail. While the bold harpooner is striking the whale. Nantucket Song. Oh, the rare old whale, mid storm and gale. In his ocean home will be. A giant in might, where might is right. And king of the boundless sea. Whale Sony Carrot. Chapter I. L00 Mings. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long. Precisely having little or no money in my purse, and nothing. Particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. When 
Ever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses, and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me, that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street, and methodically knocking people's hats off then, I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword, I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising carrot in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. There now is your insular city of the Manhattos, belted round by wharves as Indian Isles by coral reefs commerce sir. Rounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you. Waterward. Its extreme downtown is the Battery, where that noble mole is washed by waves, and cooled by breezes, which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corlayer's Hook to Contai Slip, and from thence, by 1. L-O-O-M-I-N-G-S. Whitehall, northward. What do you see? Posted like silent. Sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands. Of mortal men fixed in ocean reveries. Some leaning against the. Spiles, some seated upon the pier heads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging, as if striving to get a still better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen, of weekdays pent up in lath and plaster tide, to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they hear? But look. Here come more crowds, pacing straight for the water, and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange. Nothing. Will content them but the extremest limit of the land, loitering. Under the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No. They must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can. Without falling in. And there they stand miles of them. Leagues. Inlanders all, they come from lanes and alleys, streets, and avenues north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compasses of all those ships attract them thither? Once more, Saj, you are in the country, in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please and ten to one. It carries you down in a dale, and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries stand that man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water, if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be a thirst in the great American desert, Try this experiment, if your caravan happened to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded for ever. But here is an artist. He desires to paint you the dream. East, shoddiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic land. Scape in all the valley of the Sacco. What is the chief element? He employs. There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk. Loomings. As if a hermit and a crucifix were within, and here sleeps his. Meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage. Goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into distant woodlands winds a. Mazy way, reaching to overlapping spurs of mountains bathed. In their hillside blue. 
but though the picture lies thus tranced, and though this pine tree shakes down its size like leaves upon this shepherd's head, yet all were vain, unless the shepherd's eye were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June, when for scores on scores of miles you wade knee-deep among tiger lilies what is the one charm wanting? Water there is not a drop of water. There were Niagara but a cataract of sand, would you travel your thousand miles to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of silver, deliberate whether to buy him a coat, which he sadly needed, or invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust healthy boy with a robust healthy soul in him, at some time or other crazy to go to see? Why upon your first voyage as a passenger, did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration, when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity, and own brother of Jove? Surely all this is not without meaning. And still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who because he could not grasp the torment, ing, mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image, we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and this is the key to it all. Now, when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea, whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes, and begin to be Overconscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. For to go as a passenger, you must needs have a purse, and a purse is but a rag unless loomings. You have something in it. Besides, passengers get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep of nights, do not enjoy them. Selves much, as a general thing, no, I never go as a passenger. G.E.R., nor, though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore, or a captain, or a cook. I abon. Don the glory and distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable respectable toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself, without taking care of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, and what not. And as for going as cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer on shipboard. Yet, somehow, I never fancied broiling fowls, though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and judgmatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully, not to say reverentially, of a broiled fowl than I will. It is out of the idolatrous dotings of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse, that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bake houses the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor, right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some, and make me jump from spar to spar, like a grasshopper in a may meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is unpleasant. Enough. It touches one's sense of honor, particularly if you come of an old established family in the land, the Van Rents, Latters, or Randolphs, or Hardicanuts, and more than all. If just previous to putting your hand into the tar pot, you have been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from a schoolmaster to a sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. 
but even this wears off in time. What of it, if some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to? L-O-O-M-I-N-G-S. Get a broom and sweep down the decks? What does that? Indignity amount to, wait, I mean, in the scales of the new. Testament. Do you think the Archangel Gabriel thinks any? Thing the less of me, because I promptly and respectfully obey. That old hunks in that particular instance. Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well, then, however the old sea captain's ma. Order me about however they may thump and punch me. About, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is all right. That everybody else is one way or other served in much the same way either in a physical or metaphysical point of view. That is, and so the universal thump is passed round, and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades, and be con. Tent. Again, I always go to sea as a sailor, because they make a point of paying me for my trouble, whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the con. Trary passengers themselves must pay. And there is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two orchard thieves entailed upon us. But being paid, what will compare with it? The urbane activity with which a man receives money is really marvelous, considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly ills, and that on no account can a moneyed man enter heaven. Ah! How! Cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition. Finally, I always go to sea as a sailor, because of the whole. Some exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent than winds from astern, that is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim, so. For the most part the Commodore on the quarterdeck gets his atmosphere at second hand from the sailors on the forecastle. He thinks he breathes at first, but not so. In much the same way do the commonalty lead their leaders in many other things, at the same time that the leaders little suspect it. But. Loomings. Wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage, this the invisible police officer of the fates, who has the constant surveillance of me, and secretly dogs me, and influences me in some unaccountable way he can better answer than anyone else. And, doubtless, my going on this whaling voyage, formed part of the grand program of providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came in as a sort of brief interlude and solo between more extensive performances. I take it that this part of the bill must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States. Whaling voyage by one Ishmael. Bloody battle in Afghanistan. Though I cannot tell why it was exactly that those stage managers, the fates, put me down for this shabby part of a whaling voyage, when others were set down for magnificent parts in high tragedies, and short and easy parts in genteel comedies, and jolly parts in farces though I cannot tell why. This was exactly, yet, now that I recall all the circumstances, I think I can see a little into the springs and motives which being cunningly presented to me under various disguises, induced me to set about performing the part I did, besides cajoling me into the delusion that it was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself. Such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. Then the wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk, the undeliverable, nameless perils of the whale, these, with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds, 
help to sway me to my wish. With other men, perhaps, such things would not have been inducements, but as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas, and the carpetbag land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I am quick to perceive a horror, and could still be social with it. Would they let me since it is but well to be unfriendly? Terms with all the inmates of the place one lodges in. By reason of these things, then, the wailing voyage was W.E.L. Come, the great floodgates of the wonder world swung open. And in the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, too. And too there floated into my inmost soul, endless processions. Of the whale, and, mid most of them all, one grand hooded fan. Tom, like a snow hill in the air. Chapter 2 The Carpet Bag I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn and the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was on a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer, till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at the same new Bedford, thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing. For my mind was made up to sail in no other than a Nantucket craft, because there was a fine, boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazingly pleased me. Besides though new, Bedford has of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling, and though in this matter poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket was her great original. The carpet bag. The tire of this Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. Where else but from Nantucket? Did those aboriginal whalemen, the red men, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan? And where but from Nantucket, too, did that first adventurous little sloop put forth? Partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story to throw at the whales, in order to discover when they were nigh enough to risk a harpoon from the bowsprit. Now having a night, a day, and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious looking, nay, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew. No one in the place. With anxious grapnels I had sounded. My pocket, and only brought up a few pieces of silver, so. Wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the. Middle of a dreary street shouldering my bag, and comparing. The gloom towards the north with the darkness towards the. South wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge. For the night. My dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price. And don't be too particular. With halting steps I paced the streets, and passed the sign of the crossed harpoons but it looked too expensive and jolly there. Further on, from the bright red windows of the swordfish inn, there came such fervent rays, that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice from before the house. For everywhere else the congealed frost lay ten inches thick in a hard, asphaltic pavement, rather weary for me, when I struck my foot against the flinty projections, because from hard, remorseless service the soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly, again thought I, pausing one moment to watch the broad glare in the street, and Hear the sounds of the tinkling glasses within. But go on. Ishmael, said I at last, don't you hear? 
Get away from before. The carpet bag. The door, your patched boots are stopping the way. So on I. Went. I now by instinct followed the streets that took me. Waterward, for there, doubtless, were the cheapest, if not the. Cheeriest inns. Such dreary streets. Blocks of blackness, not houses, on. Either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving. About in a tomb. At this hour of the night, of the last day. Of the week, that quarter of the town proved all but deserted. But presently I came to a smoky light proceeding from a low. Wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. It had. A careless look, as if it way he meant for the uses of the public. So, entering, the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash. Box in the porch. Ha! Thought I, ha, as the flying particles. Almost choked me, are these ashes from that destroyed city. Gamara. But the crossed harpoons, and the sword. Fish. This, then, must needs be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up and hearing a loud voice within. Pushed on and opened a second, interior door. It seemed the great black parliament sitting in Tophet. A. Hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer, and. Beyond, a black angel of doom was beating a book in a. Pulpit. It was a negro church, and the preacher's text was. About the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing. And teeth gnashing there. Ha, Ishmael, muttered I, backing. Out, wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light not far from. The docks, and heard a forlorn creaking in the air, and looking. Up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting. Upon it, faintly representing a tall straight jet of misty spray. And these words underneath the spouter in. Peter Coffin. Coffin. Spouter. Rather ominous in that particular con. Nection, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket. They say, and I suppose this Peter here is an emigrant from there. As the light looked so dim, and the place, for the time, looked. One asterisk. Ten the carpet bag. Quiet enough, and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked. As if it might have been carted here from the ruins of some burnt. District, and as the swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of. Creek to it, I thought that here was the very spot for cheap. Lodgings, and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place a gable-ended old house, one. Side palsied as it were, and leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp bleak corner, where that tempestuous wind Euryclidon kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Euryclidon, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors, with his feet on the hob quietly, toasting for bed. In judging of that tempestuous wind called Euryclidon, says an old writer of whose works I possess the only copy extant it make the marvelous difference, whether thou lookest out at it from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest it from that sashless window, where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is the only glacier. True enough, thought I, as this passage occurred to my mind old black letter, thou reason. Est well. Yes. These eyes are even Dow's, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and the crannies though, and thrust in a little lint here and there. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished, the copestone is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow, and shaking off his tatters. With his shiverings, he might plug up both ears with rags, and 
put a corn cob into his mouth, and yet that would not keep out. The tempestuous Euryclidon. Euryclidon. Says old Dives, in. His red silken wrapper, he had a redder one afterwards, pooh. Pooh. What a fine frosty night, how Orion glitters, what. Northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climes. Of everlasting conservatories, give me the privilege of making. My own summer with my own coals. The spouter in. 11. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by? Holding them up to the grand northern lights? Would not. Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far? Rather lay him down lengthwise along the line of the equator. Yeah, yeah gods. Go down to the fiery pit itself, in order to keep. Out this frost? Now, that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone. Before the door of dives, this is more wonderful than that an iceberg should be moored to one of the Moluccas. Yet dives. Himself, he too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen size, and being a president of a temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now, we are going a wailing. And there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet, and see what sort of a place the spouter may be. Chapter I. The Spouter Inn. Entering that gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry with old-fashioned wainscots, reminding one of the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. On one side hung a very large oil painting so thoroughly be smoked, and every way defaced, that in the unequal cross-lights by which you viewed it, it was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it, and careful inquiry of the nay bourse, that you could any way arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows, that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist, in the time of the New England hags, had endeavored to Delhi. Neat chaos bewitched. But by dint of much and earnest. 12. The spouter in. Contemplation, and oft repeated ponderings, and especially by. Throwing open the little window towards the back of the entry. You at last come to the conclusion that such an idea, however. Wild, might not be altogether unwarranted. But what most puzzled and confounded you was a long. Limber, portentous black mass of something hovering in the center of the picture over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines, floating in a nameless yeast. A boggy, soggy, squitchy picture. Truly, enough to drive a nervous man distracted. Yet was. There a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity. About it that fairly froze you to it, till you involuntarily took an both with yourself to find out what that marvelous painting meant. Ever and anon a bright, but, alas, deceptive idea would dart you through. It's the Black Sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted heath. It's a hyperborean winter scene. It's the breaking up of the icebound stream of time. But at last all these fancies yielded to that one port and fam something in the picture's midst. That once found out, and all the rest were plain. But stop, does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish? Even the great Leviathan himself? In fact, the artist's design seemed this, a final theory of my own partly based upon the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed upon the subject. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane, the half found dared ship weltering there with its three dismantled masts, alone visible, and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft, 
is in the enormous dot act of impaling himself. Upon the three mastheads. The opposite wall of this entry was hung all over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. Some were thickly set with glittering teeth resembling ivory saws, others were tufted with knots of human hair, and one was sickle-shaped, with a vast handle sweeping round like the segment made in the spouter in 13. The new mown grass by a long-armed mower. You shuddered as you gazed, and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever have gone a death harvesting with such a hacking, horrifying implement. Mixed with these were rusty old wailing lances and harpoons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons. With this once long lance, now wildly elbowed, fifty years ago did Nathan Swain kill fifteen whales between a sunrise and a sunset. And that harpoon so like a corkscrew now was flung in Javan seas, and run away with by a whale, years afterwards slain off the Cape of Blanco. The original iron entered nigh the tail, and, like a restless needle, sojourning in the body of a man, traveled full forty feet, and at last was found embedded in the hump. Crossing this dusky entry, and on through yon low arched way cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all round you enter the public room. A still duskier place is this, with such low ponderous beams above, and such old wrinkled planks beneath, that you would almost fancy you trod some old craft's cockpits, esp. Chaley of such a howling night, when this corner anchored old arc rock so furiously. On one side stood a long, low, shelf, like table covered with cracked glass cases, filled with dusty rarities gathered from this wide world's remotest nooks. Pro. Jecting from the further angle of the room stands a dark, looking den the bar a rude attempt at a right whale's head. Be that how it may, there stands the vast arched bone of the whale's jaw, so wide, a coach might almost drive beneath it. Within are shabby shelves, ranged round with old decanters, bottles, flasks, and in those jaws of swift destruction, like Anno. Their cursed Jonah, by which name indeed they called him. Bustles a little withered old man, who, for their money, dearly, sells the sailors' deliriums and death. Abominable are the tumblers into which he pours his poison. Though true cylinders without within, the villainous green. 14 The Spouter in Goggling glasses deceitfully tapered downwards to a cheating Bottom Parallel meridians rudely pecked into the glass, sir Round these food pads goblets Fill to this mark, and your Charge is but a penny, to this a penny more, and so on to the Full glass the cape horn measure, which you may golf down For a shilling Upon entering the place I found a number of young seamen gathered about a table, examining by a dim light divers spissy men's of slow crimshinder. I sought the landlord, and telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that his house was full not a bed unoccupied, but a vest. He added, tapping his forehead, you hain't no objections to Sharing a harpooner's blanket, have yet? I suppose you are going a wallin, so you'd better get used to that sort of thing. I told him that I never liked to sleep too in a bed, that if I should ever do so, it would depend upon who the harpooner might be, and that if he, the landlord, really had no other place for me, and the harpooner was not decidedly objection. Able, why rather than wander further about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper. You. Want supper? Supper eleven be ready directly. I sat down on an old wooden settle, carved all over like a bench on the battery. 
at one end a ruminating tar was still. Further adorning it with his jackknife, stooping over and dealing. Gently working away at the space between his legs. He was. Trying his hand at a ship under full sail, but he didn't make. Much headway, I thought. At last some four or five of us were summoned to our meal. In an adjoining room. It was cold as Iceland no fire at all. The landlord said he couldn't afford it. Nothing but too dismal. Tallow candles, each in a winding sheet. We were fain to butt. Ton up our monkey jackets, and hold to our lips cups of scalding. The spouter in. 15. Tea with our half-frozen fingers. But the fare was of the most. Substantial kind not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings. Good heavens. Dumplings for supper. One young fellow in a. Green box coat, addressed himself to these dumplings in a most. Direful manner. My boy, said the landlord, you'll have the nightmare. To a dead sartainty. Landlord, I whispered, that ain't the harpooner, is it? Oh, no, said he, looking a sort of diabolically funny, the harpooner is a dark complex Ionid chap. He never eats dump. Lings, he don't he eats nothing but steaks, and likes em. Rare. The devil he does, says I. Where is that harpooner? Is. He here. He'll be here afore long, was the answer. I could not help it, but I began to feel suspicious of this. Dark complex Ionid harpooner. At any rate, I made up my. Mind that if it so turned out that we should sleep together, he. Must undress and get into bed before I did. Supper over, the company went back to the bar room, when. Knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the. Rest of the evening as a looker on. Presently a rioting noise was heard without. Starting up. The landlord cried, that's the Grampus's crew. I seed her. Reported in the offing this morning, a three years voyage, and. A full ship. Hurrah, boys, now we'll have the latest news from. The Figis. A tramping of sea boots was heard in the entry, the door was flung open, and enrolled a wild set of mariners enough. Enveloped in their shaggy watchcoats, and with their heads. Muffled in woolen comforters, all bedarned and ragged, and. Their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears. From Labrador. They had just landed from their boat, and this. Was the first house they entered. No wonder, then, that they. 16 The spouter in. Made a straight wake for the whale's mouth the bar when. The wrinkled little old Jonah, their officiating, soon poured. Them out brimmers all round. One complained of a bad cold. In his head, upon which Jonah mixed him a pitch-like potion of. Gin and molasses, which he swore was a sovereign cure for. All colds and catars whatsoever, never mind of how long stand. Ing or whether caught off the coast of Labrador, or on the Wii. Their side of an ice island. The liquor soon mounted into their heads as it generally does. Even with the errantest topers newly landed from sea, and they. Began capering about most obstreperously. I observed, however, that one of them held somewhat aloof. And though he seemed desirous not to spoil the hilarity of his. Shipmates by his own sober face, yet upon the whole he refrained from making as much noise as the rest. This man interested me at once, and since the sea gods had ordained that he should soon become my shipmate, though but a sleeping partner one. So far as this narrative is concerned, I will here venture upon a little description of him. He stood full six feet in height, with noble shoulders, and a chest like a coffer dam. I have seldom seen such brawn in a man. His face was deeply brown and burnt, making his white teeth dazzling by the contrast, while in the deep shadows of his eyes floated some reminiscences that 
did not seem to give him much joy. His voice at once. Dot announced that he was a southerner, and from his fine stature. I thought he must be one of those tall mountaineers from the Alleghenian Ridge in Virginia. When the revelry of his compa Neans had mounted to its height, this man slipped away unab served, and I saw no more of him till he became my comrade on the sea. In a few minutes, however, he was missed by his shipmates, and being, it seems, for some reason a huge favorite. With them, they raised a cry of Bulkington. Bulkington. Where s? Bulkington. And darted out of the house in pursuit of him. It was now about nine o'clock, and the room seeming almost. The spouter in. Seventeen. Supernaturally quiet after these orgies, I began to congratulate myself upon a little plan that had occurred to me just previous to the entrance of the seaman. No man prefers to sleep too in a bed. In fact, you would a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they are sleeping. And when it comes to sleeping with an unknown stranger, in a strange inn, in a strange town, and that stranger, a harpooner, then your objections indefinitely multiply. Nor was there any earthly reason why I as a sailor should sleep too in a bed, more than anybody else, for sailors no more sleep too in a bed at sea, than bachelor kings do ashore. To be sure they all sleep together in one apartment, but you have your own hammock, and cover yourself with your own blanket, and sleep in your own skin. The more I pondered over this harpooner, the more I abominated the thought of sleeping with him. It was fair to presume that being a harpooner, his linen or woolen, as the case might be, would not be of the tidiest, certainly none of the finest. I began to twitch all over. Besides, it was getting late. And my decent harpooner ought to be home and going bed. Wards. Suppose now, he should tumble in upon me at midnight. How could I tell from what vile hole he had been coming? Landlord. I've changed my mind about that harpooner. I shan't he sleep with him. I'll try the bench here. Just as you please, I'm sorry I can't spare ya a table cloth for a mattress, and it's a plaguey rough board here. Feeling of the knots and notches. But wait a bit, scrums hander. I've got a carpenter's plane there in the bar wait, I say, and I'll make ya snug enough. So saying he procured the plane. And with his old silk handkerchief first dusting the bench. Vigorously set to planing away at my bed, the while grinning. Like an ape. The shavings flew right and left, till at last the plain iron came bump against an indestructible knot. The 18th the spouter in. Landlord was near spraining his wrist, and I told him for heaven's sake to quit the bed was soft enough to suit me, and I did not know how all the planing in the world could make either down of a pine plank. So gathering up the shavings with another grin, and throwing them into the great stove in the middle of the room, he went about his business, and left me in a brown study. I now took the measure of the bench, and found that it was a foot too short, but that could be mended with a chair. But it was a foot too narrow, and the other bench in the room was about four inches higher than the planed one so there was no yoking them. I then placed the first bench lengthwise along the only clear space against the wall, leaving a little interval between, for my back to settle down in. But I soon found that there came such a draft of cold air over me from under the sill of the window, that this plan would never do at all. Especially as another current from the rickety door met the one from the window, and both together formed a series of Small whirlwinds in the immediate vicinity of the spot where I had thought to spend the night. 
the devil fetch that harpooner, thought I, but stop, couldn't. I steal a march on him bolt his door inside, and jump into his bed, not to be wakened by the most violent knockings. It seemed no bad idea, but upon second thoughts I dismissed it. For who could tell but what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to knock me down. Still, looking round me again, and seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night unless in some other person's bed. I began to think that after all I might be cherishing unwarrant able prejudices against this unknown harpooner. Thinks I. I'll wait a while, he must be dropping in before long. I'll have a good look at him then, and perhaps we may become jolly. Good bedfellows after all there's no telling. The spouter in. 19. But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes, and going to bed, yet no sign of my harpooner. Landlord. Said I, what sort of a chap is he does he? Always keep such late hours too it was now hard upon twelve. O'clock. The landlord chuckled again with his lean chuckle, and seemed to be mightily tickled at something beyond my calm. Pie Henshin. No, he answered, generally he's an early bird early to bed and early to rise yes, he's the bird what catches the worm. But tonight he went out a-peddling, you see, and I don't see what on earth keeps him so late, unless, may be, he can't sell his head. Can't sell his head? What sort of a bamboozingly story? Is this you are telling me be getting into a towering rage? Do you pretend to say, landlord, that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around this town? That's precisely it, said the landlord, and I told him he couldn't sell it here, the market's overstocked. With what? shouted I. With heads to be sure, ain't there too many heads in the world? I tell you what it is, landlord, said I, quite calmly, you'd better stop spinning that yarn to me I'm not green. Maybe not, taking out a stick and whittling a toothpick. Uh, but I rather guess you'll be done brown if that air harpoon here hears you a slander in his head. I'll break it for him, said I, now flying into a passion again. At this unaccountable farrago of the landlords. It's broke a ready said he. Broke, said I broke, do you mean? Sartain, and that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess. Landlord, said I, going up to him as cool as empty. Hecla in. A snowstorm, landlord, stop whittling. You and I must. Twenty the spouter in. Understand one another, and that too without delay. I come. To your house and want a bed, you tell me you can only give me half a one, that the other half belongs to a certain har. Punir. And about this harpooner, whom I have not yet seen, you persist in telling me the most mystifying and exasp. Rating stories, tending to beget in me an uncomfortable feeling. Towards the man whom you design for my bedfellow a sort of connection, landlord which is an intimate and confidential one. In the highest degree. I now demand of you to speak out and tell me who and what this harpooner is, and whether I shall be in all respects safe to spend the night with him. And in the first place, you will be so good as to unsay that story about Sel. In his head, which if true I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with a madman, and you, sir, you I mean, landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly, would thereby render yourself liable to a criminal prosecution. Wall, said the landlord, fetching a long breath, that's a 
Pretty long sermon for a chap that rips a little now and then. But be easy, be easy, this here harpooner I have been tellin'. You of has just arrived from the South Seas, where he bought up. A lot of bombed New Zealand heads, great curios, you know. And he's sold all on M but one, and that one he's trying to sell. Tonight, cause tomorrow Sunday, and it would not do to be. Sellin' human heads about the streets when folks is goin' to. Churches. He wanted to, last Sunday, but I stopped him just. As he was going out of the door with four heads strung on a string, for all the earth like a string of Indian. This account cleared up the otherwise unaccountable mystery. And showed that the landlord, after all, had had no idea of fool. Ing me but at the same time what could I think of a harpoon? Here who stayed out of a Saturday night clean into the holy S.A.B. Bath, engaged in such a cannibal business as selling the heads. Of dead idolaters? The spouter in. 21. Depend upon it, landlord, that harpooner is a dangerous. Man. He pays reglar, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting. Dreadful late, you had better be turning flukes it's a nice bed. Sale and me slept in that air bed the night we were spliced. There's plenty room for two to kick about in that bed, it's an. Almighty big bed that. Why, afore we give it up, Sal used to. Put our Sam and little Johnny in the foot of it. But I got a. Dreaming and sprawling about one night, and somehow, Sam got. Pitched on the floor, and came near breaking his arm. Arter. That, Sal said it wouldn't do. Come along here, I'll give ya a. Glim in a jiffy and so saying he lighted a candle and held it towards me, offering to lead the way. But I stood irresolute. When looking at a clock in the corner, he exclaimed I vomits. Sunday you won't see that harpooner tonight, he's come to. Anchor somewhere come along then, do come, war ct yet. Come. I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we. Went and I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big. Enough indeed for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. There, said the landlord, placing the candle on a crazy old sea chest that did double duty as a washstand and center. Table, there, make yourself comfortable now, and good night. To yet. I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. Folding back the counterpane, I stooped over the bed. Though none of the most elegant, it yet stood the scrutiny. Tolerably well. I then glanced round the room, and besides. The bedstead and center table, could see no other furniture be. Longing to the place, but a root shelf, the four walls, and a papered fireboard representing a man striking a whale. Of things not properly belonging to the room, there was a ham. Mock lashed up, and thrown upon the floor in one corner, also. 22 The S powder in. A large seaman's bag, containing the harpooner's wardrobe, no. Doubt in lieu of a land trunk. Likewise, there was a parcel of Outlandish bonefish hooks on the shelf over the fireplace, and a tall harpoon standing at the head of the bed. But what is this on the chest? I took it up, and held it, close to the light, and felt it, and smelt it, and tried every way possible to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion concern. Ing if I can compare it to nothing but a large doormat. Ornamented at the edges with little tinkling tags something like The stained porcupine quills round an Indian moccasin. There Was a hole or slit in the middle of this mat, as you see the same In South American ponchos But could it be possible that any Sober harpooner would get into a doormat, and parade the Streets of any Christian town in that sort of guise? I put it on To try it and it weighed me down like a hamper, 
being uncalm. Monly shaggy and thick, and I thought a little damp, as though. This mysterious harpooner had been wearing it of a rainy day. I went up in it to a bit of glass stuck against the wall, and I never saw such a sight in my life. I tore myself out of it in such a hurry that I gave myself a kink in the neck. I sat down on the side of the bed, and commenced thinking about this head-peddling harpooner, and his doormat. After thinking some time on the bedside, I got up and took off my monkey jacket, and then stood in the middle of the room think. Ding. I then took off my coat, and thought a little more in my shirt sleeves. But beginning to feel very cold now, half on. Dressed as I was, and remembering what the landlord said. About the harpooners not coming home at all that night, it being. So very late, I made no more ado, but jumped out of my panta. Loons and boots, and then blowing out the light tumbled into. Bed, and commended myself to the care of heaven. Whether that mattress was stuffed with corn cobs or broken. Crockery, there is no telling, but I rolled about a good deal, and. Could not sleep for a long time. At last I slid off into a light. The SP0UTER1NN. 23. Doze, and had pretty nearly made a good offing towards the land. Of Nod, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage, and saw. A glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. Lord save me, thinks I, that must be the harpooner. The infernal head peddler. But I lay perfectly still, and. Resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light. In one hand, and that identical JS2 Zealand head in the. Other, the stranger entered the room, and without looking. Towards the bed placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner, and then began working away at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned round when. Good heavens! What a sight! Such a face. It was of a dark. Purplish, yellow color, here and there stuck over with large. Blackish looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a. Terrible bedfellow, he's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and. Here he is, just from the surgeon. But at that moment he. Chanced to turn his face so towards the light, that I plainly saw. They could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stains of some sort or other. At first, I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man. A whaleman too who, falling among the cannibals, had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner, in the course of his distant voyages, must have met with a similar adventure. And what is it, thought I, after all? It's only his. Outside, a man can be honest in any sort of skin. But then, what to make of his unearthly complexion, that part of it, I mean, lying round about, and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning, but I never heard of a hot sun's tanning a white man into a purplish yellow one. However, I 24 the SP outer in slash had never been in the South Seas, and perhaps the sun there produced these extraordinary effects upon the skin. Now, while all these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this har Puneer never noticed me at all. But, after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it, and pre presently pulled out a sort of tomahawk, and a sealskin wallet, with the hair on, placing these on the old chest in the middle 
of the room, he then took the New Zealand head a ghastly thing enough and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat a new beaver hat when I came nigh singing. Out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head none. To speak of at least nothing but a small scalp not twisted up. On his forehead. His bald purplish head now looked for all. The world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood. Between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker. Than ever I bolted a dinner. Even as it was, I thought something of slipping out of the window, but it was the second floor back. I am no coward. But what to make of this head peddling purple rascal altogether? Past my comprehension. Ignorance is the parent of fear, and being completely nonplussed and confounded about the stranger, I confess I was now as much afraid of him as if it was the devil himself who had thus broken into my room at the dead of night. In fact, I was so afraid of him that I was not game enough just then to address him and demand a satisfactory answer concerning what seemed inexplicable in him. Meanwhile, he continued the business of undressing, and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face, his back, too, was all over the same dark squares, he seemed to have been in a thirty years' war, and just escaped from it with a sticking plaster shirt. Still more, his very legs were marked as if a parcel of dark green frogs were running up the trunks of young palms. It was now quite plain that he must be some. The spouter in 25. Abominable savage or other shipped aboard of a whaleman in the South Seas, and so landed in this Christian county. I quake to think of it. A peddler of heads too perhaps the heads of his own brothers. He might take a fancy to mine. Heavens! Look at that tomahawk! But there was no time for shuddering, for now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy grego, or raffle, or dreadnought, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pockets, and pro duchate at length a curious little deformed image with a who and ch on its back, and exactly the color of a three days old Congo. Baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby preserved in some similar manner. But seeing that it was not at all limber, and that it glistened a good deal like polished ebony, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace, and removing the papered fireboard, sets up this little hunchbacked image, like a tenpin, between the and irons. The chimney jams and all the bricks inside were very sooty, so that I thought this fireplace made a very apro priate little shrine or chapel for his Congo idol. I now screwed my eyes hard towards the half-hidden image feeling but ill at ease meantime to see what was next to follow. First he takes about a double handful of shavings out of his grego pocket, and places them carefully before the idol. Then laying a bit of ship biscuit on top and applying the flame. From the lamp, he kindled the shavings into a sacrificial blaze. Presently, after many hasty snatches into the fire, and still hastier withdrawals of his fingers, whereby he seemed to be scorching them badly, he at last succeeded in drawing out the biscuit, then blowing off the heat and ashes a little, he made a polite offer of it to the little negro. But the little devil did not. 2. 26 The spouter in seemed to fancy such dry sort of fare at all, he never moved his lips. All these strange antics were accompanied by still stranger guttural noises from the devotee, who seemed to be 
praying in a sing-song or else singing some pagan psalmody or other, during which his face twitched about in the most unnatural manner. At last extinguishing the fire, he took the idol up very unceremoniously, and bagged it again in his Greco pocket as carelessly as if he were a sportsman bagging a dead woodcock. All these queer proceedings increased my uncomfortableness. And seeing him now exhibiting strong symptoms of concluding his business operations, and jumping into bed with me, I thought it was high time, now or never, before the tide was put out, to break the spell in which I had so long been bound. But the interval I spent in deliberating what to say, was a fatal one. Taking up his tomahawk from the table, he examined the head of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, with his mouth at the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment the light was extinguished, and this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out, I could not help it now and giving a sudden grunt of astonishment he began feeling me stammering out something i knew not what i rolled away from him against the wall and then conjured him whoever or whatever he might be to keep quiet and let me get up and light the lamp again but his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning who e w he at last said you no know, speak e. Damn me, I kill e. And so saying the lighted tomahawk began. Flourishing about me in the dark. Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin. Shouted I. Land. Lord. Watch. Coffin. Angels. Save me. Speak e. Tell e me who e e be, or damn me, I kill e. Again. The spouter in. 27. Growled the cannibal, while his horrid flourishings of the. Tomahawk scattered the hot tobacco ashes about me till I. Thought my linen would get on fire. But thank heaven, at. That moment the landlord came into the room light in hand. And leaping from the bed I ran up to him. Don't be afraid now, said he, grinning again. Quick. Here wouldn't harm a hair of your head. Stop your grinning, shouted I, and why didn't you tell me that that infernal harpooner was a cannibal? I thought ya knowed it, didn't I tell ya, he was a peddlin. Heads around town? But turn flukes again and go to sleep. Queek, look here you savvy me, I savvy you this man. Sleep you you savvy. Me savvy plenty grunted Queek puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. You get tea in, he added, motioning to me with his toma. Hawk, and throwing the clothes to one side. He really did this. In not only a civil but a really kind and charitable way. I stood looking at him a moment. For all his tattooings he was. On the whole a clean, comely looking cannibal. What's all this? fuss I have been making about, thought I to myself the man's. A human being just as I am, he has just as much reason to fear me, as I have to be afraid of him. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there. Or pipe, or whatever you call it, tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured. This being told to Queek, he at once complied, and again politely motioned me to get into bed rolling over to one side. As much as to say I won't touch a leg of yet. Good night, landlord, said I, you may go. I turned in, and never slept better in my life. 28 The Counterpane Chapter 4 The Counterpane 
Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Kui. Queg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of odd little parti colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were of one precise shade owing I suppose to his keep. Ing his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade, his shirt. Sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times the same arm of. His, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same. Patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did. When I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt, they. So blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Queek was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar C.I.R. come stance that befell me, whether it was a reality or a dream. I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other I think it was. Trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do. A few days previous, and my stepmother who, somehow or other, was all the time whipping me, or sending me to bed. Supperless, my mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day in the year in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully. But there was no help for it, so upstairs I went to my little room in the third. The counterpane. 29. Floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time. And with a bitter sig got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating that sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was. So light too, the sun shining in at the window, and a great rattling of coaches in the streets, and the sound of gay voices. All over the house. I felt worse and worse at last I got up. Dressed, and softly going down in my stockinged feet, sought out. My stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseech her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior, anything indeed but condemning me to he abed. Such an unendurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze, and slowly waking from it half steeped in dreams I opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all my frame, nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard, but a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane. And the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom, to which the hand belonged, seemed closely seated by my bed. Side. For what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen. With the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand. Yet ever thinking that if I could but stir it one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this conscious Ness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning. I shudderingly remembered it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour, I often puzzle myself with it. 30 The Counterpane Now, take away the awful fear, and my sensations at feeling 
the supernatural hand in mine were very similar, in their strange ness, to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Queek's pagan arm thrown round me. But at length all the past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality, and then I lay only alive to the comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm unlock his bridegroom clasp yet, sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him quick. But his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse collar. And suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counter pain, there lay the tomahawk sleeping by the savage's side, as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought. I, a bet here in a strange house in the broad day, with a can I. B.A.L. and a tomahawk? Queek. In the name of goodness. Queek, wake. At length, by dint of much wriggling, and loud and incessant expostulations upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in that matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently, he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike staff, looking at me, and rubbing his eyes as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there, though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seemed slowly dawning over him. Mean. While, I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings. Now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When, at last, his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact. He jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds, gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first, and then leave me to dress afterwards, leaving the whole apart. Meant to myself. Thinks I, Queek, under the circumstances. This is a very civilized overture, but, the truth is, these savages. The counterpane. 31 have an innate sense of delicacy, say what you will, it is mar. Velas how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queek, because he treated me with so much civility and consideration, while I was guilty of great rudeness. Staling at him from the bed, and watching all his toilette emo. Shins, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breed. Hing. Nevertheless, a man like Queek you don't see every day, he and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then still minus his trousers he hunted up his boots. What under the heavens he did it for, I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself boots in hand, and hat on under the bed when, from sundry violent gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of, is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But, Queek, do you see, was a creature in the transition state. Neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. 8. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he very pro. Babley would not have troubled himself with boots at all, but. Then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have. Dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last, he emerged with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp, wrinkled 
cowhide ones probably not made to order either rather. Pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold. Morning. Seeing, now, that there were no curtains to the window, and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queek made, staving about with little. 32 Breakfast. Else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied, and then pro seed to wash himself. At that time in the morning any Christian would have washed his face, but Queek, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat, and taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, when lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the carrot tea fed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigor. A scraping, or rather harpooning of his cheeks. Thinks I. Queek, this is using Rogers's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards I wondered the less at this operation when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. Chapter V Breakfast I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar room, accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice towards him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing, the more's the pity. So, if anyone. Breakfast. 33. Man, in his own proper person, affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The barroom was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in, the night previous, and whom I had not as yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates, and second mates, and third mates, and sea carpenters, and sea coopers, and sea blacksmiths, and harpooners, and shipkeep. ERS, a brown and brawny company, with bosky beards, an unshorn, shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly tell how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue, and would seem to smell almost as musky, he can not have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That Man next to him looks a few shades lighter, you might say a touch of satinwood is in him. In the complexion of a third. Still lingers a tropic tone, but slightly bleached withal, he. Doubtless has tamed whole weeks ashore. But who could show. A cheek like quick. Which, barred with various tints, seemed. Like the Andes western slope, to show forth in one array, con. Trusting climates, zone by zone. Grub, ho. Now cried the landlord, flinging open a door. And in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world, thereby become. Quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not. Always, though, Ledyard, the great New England traveler, and. Mungo Park, the Scotch one 
of all men, they possessed the least assurance in the parlor. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs as Ledyard did, or the taking a long solitary walk on an empty stomach, in the Negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances. O oh, asterisk. It. 34 Breakfast. This kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections I ist here are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table, and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small sir prize, nearly every man maintained a profound silence. And not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea dogs, many of whom without the slightest bashfulness had boarded great whales on the high seas entire strangers to them and dueled them dead without winking, and yet, here, they sat at a social breakfast table all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Queek, why, Queek sat there among them at the head of the table, too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it, to the imminent jeopardy of many heads and grappling the beefsteaks towards him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and every one knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of all Queek's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls, and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks, done rare enough, that when break Fast was over he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly digest, ing and smoking with his inseparable hat on, when I sallied out for a stroll. The Street 35 Chapter 6 The Street If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queek circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Laskers and Malays. And at Bombay, in the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scared the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street. And Wapping. In these last mentioned haunts you see only sailors, but in New Bedford, actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare. But, besides the Fijians, Tongatebaors, Oromangoans, Panangians, and Brygians, and, besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which unheeded reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in this town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshire men, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young, of stalwart frames, fellows, who have felled forests, and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lance. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. 
in some things you would think them but a few hours old. Look there. That chap strut. Ting round the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallow. 36, the street. Tailed coat, girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here. Comes another with a Sue Wester and a bombazine cloak. No town bred dandy will compare with a country bred one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy a fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation, and joins the great whale fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. In bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas. Trousers. Ah, poor hayseed. How bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale, when thou art driven, straps, buttons, and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals, and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still, New Bedford is a queer place. Had it not been for us whale men, that tract of land would this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her back country are enough to frighten one, they look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in, in all New England. It is a land of oil, true enough, but not like Canaan, a land, also, of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs. Yet, in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. Whence came they? How? Planted upon this once scraggy scoria of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round. Yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can Herr Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for dowers to Blue. 37. Their daughters, and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises. A piece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wed. Ding, for, they say, they have reservoirs of oil in every house. And E.B. Knight recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti. Candles. In summertime, the town is sweet to see, full of fine. Maples long avenues of green and gold. And in August. High in awe, the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts, Kanda. Laverwise, proffer the passer by their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which in many a district of New Bedford has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford, they bloom like their own. Red roses. But roses only bloom in summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match that bloom of theirs, ye cannot. Save in Salem, where they tell me the young girls breathe such musk, their sailor sweethearts smell them miles offshore, as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Moluccas instead of the Puritanic sands.